A, a mass extinction is just defined as a moment in time, which is a, geologically speaking, a short moment in time, when the diversity of life on Earth plummets. One very well-known paleontologist has described the whole history of life as, as long periods of boredom interrupted occasionally by panic. And these are the moments of panic. And your chances as a species of going extinct at any you know, given moment are very, very low, except during moments of mass extinction, when they skyrocket. In the case of, of the, the five major mass extinctions of the last half billion years, roughly three quarters of all species have been eliminated uh, at those moments. And then after that, diversity starts to tick up again, but it takes uh, somewhere usually between five and 10 million years for that recovery process to take place. And, and your thesis, one of the things you've seen is that we might be causing another, that we being human beings. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're really inured to extinction, so we see stories all the day. There's just a story, uh, I think it was today, uh, about how you know lemurs, 90% of all lemurs uh, on Madagascar, 90% of the species are endangered. Many are critically endangered, down to like 18 individuals. So we're just like, oh, another extinction, as if that's something that happens all the time. But what what history shows us is that if you, if you, Ezra Klein, you know, can see one species going extinct in the course of your lifetime, right? You're, you're a young man. You've already, the species have already gone extinct in your lifetime. Uh, something really unusual is going on. You should not be able to see a single species of mammal go extinct in your lifetime. And how, what, what level of die-off are we talking? Do you need yeah, for something to, to, to be rise to a that mass level. extinction or even a minor mass extinction? Well, the minor mass extinction is a little bit a little bit fuzzy, but the major ones, the five, yeah. are they're sometimes called the big five. Uh, the cutoff, if you if you will, uh, is uh, roughly three quarters of all species on the planet wow. disappear in, in, as I say, in a relatively short amount of time. I think it is at this point conventional wisdom, though, as you write, it, it hasn't always been that the extinction, the mass extinction that led to the death of the dinosaurs was a, uh, an asteroid hitting the Earth. But what are the kinds of events, because I don't think folks know, I certainly didn't know the other four. Right. What are the kinds of events, and, and recognizing that not everything is fully proven, yeah. that have typically been behind these kinds of uh, extinction events? Well, it's, it's, a, it's sort of an un, unfinished story, as you say. When, when the, what's called the, the impact hypothesis, that you know, that a, an asteroid impact was what ended the Cretaceous period and did in the, the, the dinosaurs and the whole, what's known as the whole Mesozoic fauna, there's this whole fauna uh, that, that disappeared at that moment. Um, and when that was confirmed only in the 90s, only let's say 20 years ago, um, people s went back and they sort of thought, well, we're going to find an asteroid impact at all of these junctures. That would make sense. That would be very elegant, you know, and we're going to find that. And they really looked hard and they couldn't find any evidence of that. And now um, the general, there's a sort of a consensus that the first one, which happened 440 million years ago when most of life was confined to the water, uh, was caused by this snap sort of glaciation. The world suddenly got very cold. Um, so that's the working hypothesis there. Uh, the most severe mass extinction of all time was about 250 million years ago at the end of the Permian period. And uh, it seems pretty clear that that was caused by some kind of massive outpouring of carbon dioxide, which caused really serious global warming and acidified the oceans, changed the chemistry of the oceans very radically. And one of the really sobering things uh, to think about is that is what we're doing, massively pouring carbon dioxide uh, into the air and into the water. Uh, so increasingly, people are drawing parallels between what we're doing uh, and the worst mass extinction of all time. So what do we think happened, though? I mean, obviously, uh, at that period, we didn't have a lot of SUVs <laughs> roaming the world. So yeah, how did all the yeah. carbon dioxide get released? Well, you've, you've, right, you've put your finger on a, on a big scientific mystery, to be honest. I'm um, an incredible scientist. Yeah, yeah. Where did it come from? It's so, it was so much carbon dioxide that it's very, been very difficult for people to... Um, even think of what the source might be. And, and the sort of lead candidate is um, a sort of burst of, of, of volcanism, these volcanic events that happen and create these huge, what are called igneous provinces. A lot of Siberia is covered mm -hmm. with this ancient lava from this event. Uh, that's sort of the lead mm -hmm. candidate. But 
uh, people who have tried to date that, they've had a, the dates have not exactly lined up, so we're not sure, we're not exactly sure. And one of the really terrifying parts of your almost nonstop terrifying book <laughs> is that the quantity of carbon dioxide that we're emitting at the moment, uh, every day, every year, every month, every year, is not just similar to, but potentially faster than the carbon dioxide emission that led to that extinction. Yes, yes, yes. People who have looked at, uh, tried to compare, we, we can tease out, I mean, scientists have come up with amazing methods of, you know, following these cold cases, a 250 million year old, you know, murder mystery of teasing out uh, from things like uh, sh shells, the bodies of shells and things like that, how, how much carbon um, was poured into the atmosphere at that point in time and have concluded that the rate that we are pouring CO2 into the air is certainly comparable and perhaps greater than uh, was occurring then. So this I thought was one of the really fascinating like conceptual things I learned from the book that I, I had not I think ever understood or put my finger on before which is the thing you really emphasize is the rate of change in kind of the rules of survival. So the issue is not that the world has not changed before it's just it does on very slow geologic um, time frames but that right. in these mass extinction events it's usually not necessarily the the singular impact or the one or the you know it's not that everybody dies in the lava it's that oftentimes what happens then changes uh, the temperature changes the climate it changes the oceans and it does so at a rate of change that uh, organisms simply can't adapt to the way you say it in the book is that the rules of life change more rapidly than that than life can actually keep up right. um, and I thought that was fascinating because I think that, that that is in some ways to me what really offends or, or is a problem with our intuition around global warming, that things seem to us with our tiny blink of the geologic eye lifespans to be happening slowly. It's not right. that much warmer it was than a week ago, but that in terms of the earth and in terms of how rapidly species evolve, this is like shocking, dramatic, fast forward, training montage style change. Uh, it, absolutely, I mean that is really the, the heart you know, of the book. and when you think, uh, try to think about things in the, in the grand scale, which is what a lot of the scientists you know, that I went out with, paleontologists, biologists, are, are trying to do, you know, one theme that came through in a lot of their remarks was, it, 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 we will look back, this event, you know, our, our whole human history, all of every, since our species evolved, will be compressed eventually in geological time. You know, down to this very thin layer, like we look back on the past and see this very thin layer that represents, say, uh, the end of the Cretaceous period. And change is occurring so fast that it will look not dissimilar to an asteroid impact because, you know, uh, 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 the difference between a, a year, a hundred years, a thousand years is erased in, in geological time. So that's absolutely right that what we say, well, you know, things are not changing that quickly in, in, in the whole course of geological history, things are changing very, very rapidly. And just to give one example that I think people can relate to or, or understand, you know, the Arctic ice cap, okay, which has been there for millions of years, uh, is probably going to be gone uh, in your lifetime. You're going to be able to go uh, to the North Pole in the summertime uh, and swim around, paddle around if you were very, you know, were, um, in the polar bear club or whatever. And that is a huge change on the surface of the earth and it will occur you know in the lifetime of a lot of people who are alive today. I want to ask the same question here from two different directions. First direction is I think in, in some ways the sort of selfish human direction. So you would know and I, I don't remember off the top of my head what the what a, a plausible estimate of the percentage of all species it will die off over the period of what you might think of this extinction comprising. And I think the question some people sometimes ask is, who cares? Who cares if there are fewer kinds of snails, fewer kinds of bats? Right. Um, some of the things I I in the book, I think you can imagine people reading think, great. Those bats will not be around right. to, to freak me out. So we could lead to this incredible die-off uh, in species diversity, but who cares? What are we getting as a, as a yeah. race out of having all these different kinds of, of, of animals in the tropics, say? Well, I get asked that question all the time. <laughs> And I sort of have two, uh, two answers for it. One is, you know, we're talking about uh, life on this planet, the diversity, and I think many people would say, even if you know, they live in 
uh, the middle of Manhattan or, or the middle of DC, the, the beauty and variety of the planet. And it is unraveling, and it took tens of millions of years to evolve to this point, and it's unraveling very, very quickly. And so one, you know, sort of gut response I guess I have is, if you don't care about that, you know, I'm, I'm just not sure what you'd care about, you know, mm -hmm. what, what, would you, what would you care about? And on a more kind of, um, okay, you know, if you don't, if you don't, if you still don't care, I would say, uh, I would go back to one of the quotes that you alluded to before, which is that at these moments of mass extinction, it seems that the rules of the survival game change. Uh, and once very dominant groups, for example, the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs were not you know, doing anything wrong. There was nothing right. wrong with the dinosaurs. And they were, they were gone, 100% of them were gone. Uh, we don't know exactly why, you know, why they were particularly vulnerable, but they're gone. And you know, when you're changing the rules of the survival game, as we are, then you don't know where that, that game is going right. to end up. Well, so, and that gets to, in some ways, the other direction I want to ask that question from. I kept imagining reading your book, this book being read by somebody 5,000 years ago by an alien, <laughs> I'm sorry, not 5,000 years ago, 5,000 years from now. And that's a from, cool a, thought. from a certain mm. perspective, it is such a monstrous thing to imagine that we know that we are killing off a tremendous quantity, like not just a lot of it, but a lot of life on this planet. Right. And it's just fine. It's inconvenient to think about. It would be difficult maybe to change. It would just be a hassle. And so we just kind of don't worry about it. I mean, I think to somebody with a somewhat larger time frame than our own to imagine that there was a species that existed here briefly um, at this point in the sort of span of, 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 of living of, of organic evolution. and just didn't really care that it was wiping everything else out. I don't think we would be judged kindly by that society. No, I don't think we would. And, and you know, obviously I'm, I'm going to argue, having you know, written on this subject, that, that, that we shouldn't be judged kindly. Um, one of the scientists that I went out with to the, to the Great Barrier Reef, a, a guy named Ken Caldera, who's out at Stanford, made the point to me when we were out on the reef, which is, you know, the Great Barrier Reef, which is, under siege, absolutely, but it's still a fantastic, fantastic place. Look, if the, if the Romans, right, who are, whom we feel a pretty mm -hmm. significant you know, connection to, had burned through all the fossil fuels the way we are burning through right. them now, this reef would not exist, right? It would already mm -hmm. be gone. At the rate that we are burning through fossil fuels, there are very, very robust predictions that coral reefs will start to disappear around the middle of this century, right. okay? There will be no more coral reefs by the end of this century. So, you know, the rate at which we're doing these things, this once again gets back to rate. Uh, and in, I thought that was a really interesting perspective, right? I mean, we are, we are not that far from the Romans, uh, and yet, <clears throat> you know, had they done what we did, the world would be a totally different place. Right, and then, you know, I think there's another way of looking at this, which is that this kind of die-off is a warning system for us too. I mean, I think that there is a, an impression human beings are ingenious, we're innovative, we come up with new plans, we come up with new ways, we live in places nobody ever thought we could live. And yet, you think about things like the asteroid hitting the Earth, there's a lot we actually can't survive. Earthquakes, fires rip through, um, rip through forests, and it turns out that oftentimes tsunamis, in the face of really tremendous natural disaster or change, our capacity to endure is not always what we'd hoped. Back um, in 2006, when you wrote your last book, the global sort of goal was to keep warming under two degrees Celsius. It now looks very clear that we're gonna blow by that. Um, we may go up to four, it's plausible that we could go higher over the next couple hundred years. That's a swing that is bigger uh, upward than the downward swing to the ice age, or at least is comparable in size. And it is, I think, a very, hopeful but not certain idea that, well, that might be really bad for the snails, but we're going to be fine. It isn't obvious to me, like on the kind of rate of change we're doing, that you know, particularly if things don't go exactly as we hope on the innovation curve in the next hundred years, that we're going to have such an easy time handling it. Well, there, there's, you know, when you deal with human beings, you're, 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 you are dealing with a creature that, you know, what, certainly one of the main points is, of my book is you're, you are dealing with a creature that's very different from a snail that has this world-altering capacity. Um, but there are two, two levels at which you have to consider the future of, of, of hu human beings and humanity. And one is, uh, you know, on the level of the species, right? So, 
you know, species can survive if a few individual, <laughs> you know, if a few dinosaurs had survived, you know, we might well still have dinosaurs. Um, but then we have human society, which is much more vulnerable and much more interconnected, uh, you know, than, than random pockets, you know, of, mm -hmm. of, of people. Um, and I think, once again, this is not an original idea at all, but many, you know, sort of people who are looking at, at this issue would say, well, okay, what's, what's really uh, under, th under very serious risk here, what we're really, really putting at risk, uh, is not necessarily our own survival as a species, because uh, we are very clever and, you know, there are a lot of us and we live all over the planet, mm -hmm. which is extremely unusual. Most species do not. Right. Uh, but our society depends on stability, right. you know, and if you start really uh, destabilizing the natural systems on which we depend, destabilizing the climate, uh, we, we just don't know, you know, what's going to happen uh, with that. And people do point to, and it's very hard to know where, where the analogies lie, you know, moments, for example, the Mayans seem to have been done in by a terrible drought. They were a very sophisticated civilization. Now the Mayan people, there are still Mayan mm -hmm. people out there, but Mayan civilization collapsed. And so, you know, where are those thresholds? You know, the, the book has this fascinating dimension where it's this incredibly beautiful travelogue of the apocalypse, in a way, for a lot of <laughs> species. It, it reminded me, I was thinking back to that book that was big a couple years ago, 100 Places to See Before You Die. This was kind of like a dozen that you got to see before we killed them. Right, right, But I, I'm right. curious in those travels, what was the most hopeful thing you saw or that you heard along the way? Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good question. I, I went to the, to the Amazon and um, it's not actually in the book, um, but I went out into the forest with a, people who were actually trying to sort of incentivize, to use the current term, people, you know, not to chop down the rainforest, not to illegally log. And so we talked to some of these people who used to make a living, and it wasn't a good living, to be honest, illegally logging. And for a relatively small amount of money, you know, they had been converted to people protecting the forest. And that was a very, um, that was really a great experience and a moving experience. And, and it was a very small scale thing, you know, mm -hmm. it had to be, would have to be ratcheted up by, you know, a, a million fold or whatever. But it, it was a hopeful thing that people, you know, who, who, had seen themselves as having an investment in cutting down the forest could could turn within a relatively short amount of time to seeing themselves as having an investment in in not cutting down the forest. Um, so I think that you know there are ways to sort of shift our thinking. How's that? And that's a good example of, of people who you know are living very close to the edge of existence who could shift their thinking. And if you think well, they can do it, then you think that, well, those of us who really have way, way more than we ever could possibly need uh, could also do it. Elizabeth Colbert, The Sixth Extinction, buy it, read it, stop it. <laughs> <laughs>